Okay, the main reason we're here, uh, if you look, look at the videos, you can kind of have so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about, especially you know, with the wealth of knowledge that both of them have. And um, uh, um, just if you, if, you, if, if, you, if you take and kidnap Dr. Joseph for a day, you would never finish a conversation in education. Do you know what I mean? So it's like forever and ever. But today we want to be slightly more focused. We do want to be slightly more focused. We want to talk about digital. We want to talk about what's happening, the change that's happening to our world. Every other 18 to 30 seconds, the world's changing. Simply because the amount of content, the amount of creativity that's being shared today is way more than ever, ever before. So now, as artists, half the book here is artists, more than half the book, what are we going to do? What are the questions that we're asking? Sure, you're not asking any questions. Because you aren't even thinking about it yet? That's crazy, right? We have been living in this, this crazy content sharing, digital thing, this way thing, everything is, you know, we have industry 4.0, we have society 5.0. What the art? Art what point oh? Point what oh? I don't know. We're not even talking about this. Why are we not? Are we too sombo to talk about it? So, we'll ask that question first. We'll come back. Because I mean, we know that I was going to start with both of them talking about a little bit about themselves, but we kind of know them quite well from the video already. So I thought we would just dive straight in and talk about why do you think um, young people, or artists actually, specifically artists, aren't thinking about their role in the digital world. What's missing here? Why are we not? Is it already, are we thinking really, are we already thinking too much about art, about what we're trying to create, that we don't have space and time? Or is it really just, we don't need to care about it? Dr. I think this is really something that uh, we all have to talk about and think about. Uh, I begin, I will begin by talking about uh, the role that uh, the world of digital uh, or digital technology is being used in arts education in Hong Kong, uh, where I work. And the school, the college that I work at, has invested something like, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 20 million uh, Malaysian ringgit in developing uh, what they call an information hub, which is uh, a new unit within, within our college. And they take digital media very, very seriously. So for example, we are all encouraged, all the teachers are encouraged to uh, we have a student learning system and mechanism. So these are all basically your course outlines, your assignments and everything that's placed online. And the students actually engage with the lecturer online. So we give them, uh, even though I do meet, meet with them face to face as well, but then I, give, uh, I can give them a time between which you have to send in your assignment. And then there are boxes you take. Uh, do you send in your assignment text only or are you allowed to upload a file, etc, etc. And then I can put on that all the information that I use in class, all the videos that I set. So for example, if I'm teaching contemporary dance in action to the master students, it's about what are the changes in contemporary dance in the world. So what are we talking about when we talk about the Bauhaus movement? Or what are, why, why is the triadic ballet so important in the world of dance, etc. So the examples will be there and then we can also have an online chat. You know, so this engagement can happen at any time of day. So it doesn't have to happen in the one hour or the one and a half hours in the class. And especially if the class I'm teaching it has 35 students, it's sometimes very difficult, as you all know, we know. Some students uh, enjoy conversing and talking, and others don't. So when you have the ones that speak a lot, they kind of monopolize the class, and then the others are a little, they like to take a step back. So, digital technology is huge at the college that I'm doing, uh, working in Hong Kong. And I believe that we are one of the leaders in Asia for this technology. Uh, we also have cameras in the class. Uh, they call, um, oh, I can't remember, not CCTV. Uh, so, the function of this camera is that we can then uh, have conference calls, obviously. But we can also link with other studios across the world. So, for example, this year is the centenary of Merce Cunningham's passing. So, all over the world, for this whole year of 2019, people are celebrating Merce Cunningham's choreography. So what happens is, in Hong Kong, they will be rehearsing Merce Cunningham. In Western Australia, they will be rehearsing Merce Cunningham. In NYU, they will be rehearsing Merce Cunningham. It all happens at the same time, or nearly the same time. And we can connect 
Or if I have gone to a school and I've taught choreography, I can watch the students rehearse when I am somewhere else. And there is a camera, you can set the camera, the camera because there are like eight cameras for all different angles. And you set the camera on one dancer, so let's say the principal dancer. I want to see what the principal dancer is doing for this fight, uh, eight counts of eight, for example. So the choreographer can see that. So that kind of thing, we are, Malaysia is so ridiculously far behind, I don't know what to say. I mean, we don't even have top proper toilets in our school, so <laughs> shall I begin there? You know? So, I mean, this is very, very frustrating. And what is frustrating is that it's not as if Malaysia doesn't have the money. We do, you know, but we just use it in different places like Beli Bunga, Bila the Menteri Datang and all that, you know. So this is very normal for us, right? But over there, no. We're not allowed to take presents even from people because it's all about uh, corruption and legality of these kind of things. So I'm, I'm straying away from the issue. But the issue of uh, digital technology is absolutely critical in the development of arts education. Uh, and then of course we do motion capture. And then you have MOOC. I don't know what it stands for. It's basically an online teaching course and they have MOOC for uh, Chinese Cantonese opera. So I'm thinking, God, we need to do MOOC for Mark Yong and Wayne Gullet, you know? So my, my, while I'm learning stuff there, I'm always thinking about, oh, what should I do here in Malaysia, you know what I'm saying? And then they have the 360 camera, and then you can not be at a show, which we don't encourage, we want you to be at a show, but you can just wear those ca the, the glasses, and you can have a 360 yeah. Yeah, uh, virtual reality at that moment. So I'll just stop there for now. Yeah, but you see, this is just, we're just, you know, nearly touching the surface of just talking about using it as a teaching platform. So, the, the question that you will also be asking later, which I hope you're asking, would be really how can artists use it to engage with audience, which is very important because we're just now, we're only talking about how educators are engaging with um, students and also how students are engaging with other students around the world, how education is connected to other educators around the world, but, you know, each one of us has artists, mature artists, or as artists who are, you know, uh, putting out more and more stuff. How are we going to use this knowledge to do what we are doing? So, talking to an artist, Ziawi, what kind of change has happened to you um, since, you know, you started this a while back and now you know, it's different? So, what kind of change do you, caught, do you catch yourself, you know, like, hey, I, I wasn't considering this before and now I am, you know, I'm shocked and surprised. Like, what's this? We live in a boba tea and salted egg sauce and Matcha tea and self care, self love climate right now. So, because <laughs> I think um, I started uh, really utilizing a platform, and my platform was YouTube, but that was back in 2007. <gasps> when years ago. My mom was like, YouTube, what is that? <laughs> what kind of videos? What kind of videos? And not that kind of videos. <laughs> um, and you know, it wasn't even a household name. And uh, now, you know, it, it's becoming, it's the new TV. Every child wants to be a new TV. Absolutely. And back then, I think, you know, I, I can safely say that I am from, I think I am the last generation to ever have to wait for the internet. Do you remember that? The modem, the jaring, jaring net, remember? Come back from school, even before you took up, just call out, just like throw your bag, and then you're like, oh my god, I need to go to MIRC. I hope to God mom doesn't know what picks up the phone because I want to stay online, talk to this boy. And, um, and then quickly after, broadband came and then we had you know, social media, we had friends, and then we had MySpace. And then this new visual outlet, which was YouTube, came about. And I never thought, because I always say I thought I feel it, like despite how I got my start. And um, YouTube quickly became, you know, an outlet for displaying so much talent, so much gifts, and you know, the content is just going boom, boom, boom. And YouTube back then was much different than what it is now. So I can also say I'm the last generation to ever really expect something like YouTube to be a source of income. And you know, and then there comes Instagram, and then you have new jobs now. Like right? you can be a public figure, you can be an influencer, you know, and like charge for posts. So.
So I think like I personally have to really sort of even though it's, it's really tiring, yeah, social media actually I'm like, you know, you your your decisions in the day become like <laughs> you know, like do I put this in the layout, do I want to pull picture this or which one is for Snapchat, which one is IGTV, which one is Insta story, you know, but I mean um, it's worked it's worked. Evidently it's it's a whole different market, a whole different business now and I think yeah, as you know people because we are considered kind of in the crux of being millennials and I think we are the co-creators of you know social media and social content, especially when it comes to utilizing technology as a form of really using that to have accessible knowledge because now you know you can learn the guitar from YouTube. You can learn a lot of basic, you know, things that you need to learn from a space like YouTube. Or you just go and Google your best friend and ask like how to boil water or something, you know? <laughs> Which I know actually there's a YouTube video on how to boil water, like wow. Yeah. So, yeah. But how do you constantly also be on the chase for uh, platforms for new platforms that come out so that you are updated or so you're trying new platforms, you're trying new ways, you know. To yeah, do. actually, you know like there's always updates like for something like Instagram, there's always updates or all the time. All the time and you have to like upkeep with that and it's like, oh, okay, you can do this now, like you can put moving filters on your stories now and then you kind of have to utilize that. And it's so tiring, you know, because like I, I take a trend, you know. <laughs> And uh, I'm always the last to know about everything. Like I was one of the last to go on Instagram actually. And you know, thankfully I have like a team helping me out sometimes with it and like they update me like, okay, you know, you can do this with that now. Um, but yeah, I think it's also it's important to find out what the next best thing is. Like I was trying to figure out, okay, is there another app that's going to be as important as Instagram? Now I use the word important because really now numbers don't lie, no matter what industry you're in. I have friends who are models and on their you know on their portfolio now they have to put their name, all their measurements and stuff, and the number of followers they have on all of their social media. You know, but okay, that's a different conversation altogether. But yeah. I'm curious about um, um do you, as an artist, do you not get angry that we are just using technology as a user? We're not a part of the creation of technology. We're not part of that. So we are always being guided by Instagram, Billie Jean, Atuka, when they want to change this to this. We have no control yeah. except for the fact that, okay, I'll learn, right? Yeah. So that's infuriating. And I think there needs to be artists thinking about what do we want? What do we want to send out to our audience? How do we want to engage this with our audience? How, how do you deal with it? How do you think about that sort of stuff? I think um, if you were talking about what you're from the generation of waiting for the internet to connect, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, from, about I'm from the generation of no mobile phone. <laughs> okay? We used to go to the phone box at the football field and put in 20 cents and call. Okay, so, right? okay. so the transition is really interesting. Um, I'm very fascinated by new means of communication. And so uh, sometimes I think I'm far more active on social media than my students are on the dance side. And I always give them a hard time. And I'm like, you know, if it's not on social media, it's not happening. You know, so this is the, the kind of the mindset of the 21st century. So I'm always telling them, look, nobody knows who you are, you know, because you're not doing anything on Instagram, right? You're not doing anything on Facebook, you're not sharing. You don't know how to share. There's also strategies of how to share because of all the way the algorithms work and so on. So you really need to figure it out. If you just share it from somebody else's page, nobody's going to like it. So you got to spend some time downloading it, blah, 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 then uploading it back and so on, you know. So I love this stuff. So I'm thinking like, okay, for a 59-year-old 59, 59 year old man, I think I'm like, okay, not bad. Stop. Stop. Yeah. So I'm thinking this is very important for the new generation of connecting across borders. So this is communication. We're still not talking about content creation. We're not talking about using technology. 
And that's the other thing that I want to talk about, but I don't know whether, maybe I'll just say it now, about so many um, artists now who are collaborating across disciplines. So, uh, a really fascinating example is a lady that I met, uh, she's a dance choreographer, but she received a grant from a French slash Swiss science company and they do quantum physics and they had a space for one artist to work with them for six months and she was thinking like what am I going to do with these quantum physicists I know nothing about it but she said you know I'm free I have six months let me see what I can do so she went and she went to this place and she studied with the followed the scientists around and then she went back and they, they were about creating material for example that you want to take to outer space you know, whatever kind of material it is uh, that you make your spacesuits with or whatever. And she used that material in her new choreography. So I think this is really not happening yeah. at all, yeah. maybe in Malaysia, yeah. among the dance community for sure. <laughs> so I said, you know, we're still, okay, yes, I am the most mumpertahankan tradisi person that you know. I've spent my life doing the fact that all of these young people who I or here who know Tari Inai and Tari Inai and Mak Yung and blah 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 was because I insisted that they have to learn it. And they might have hated it, but they learned it and now it's so valuable. And this is the thing that's going to help them go overseas because God knows that Bakon Tondus and Pirouettes aren't so great, you know? So, <laughs> right? <laughs> no comment, you're <laughs> so, so much to do So I feel it's so important to engage with people across disciplines and people are doing that in the creation of choreography. So multidisciplinary art. It's, but at the same time, I don't think you just jump on the bandwagon. It's because, okay, this is the way I can get funding. Because a lot of that happens. There's a lot of funding in the sciences and not so much in the arts. So the new university in New Zealand, um, Auckland University, they're doing a lot of work with uh, the, I think the engineering department to develop uh, tools and strategies that are going to be using problem solving skills of artists. So they, this is like a research. So there's a lot of money in research for this kind of thing. So people jump on those bandwagons. I don't think this is what it's about. I, I'm seriously thinking about how can we use technology and go beyond the digital art and digital media to create you know, work that we can export, work that can be seen across the globe, which I don't think in dance we have enough of at the moment. So one of the one of the better shows as well as better collaboration that I've actually seen are between dancers and uh, people who map out movements. So I, I think dancers are able to move part of the bodies that we didn't know we have. Um, normal people like me, I thought I would just like, hey, there's all these things that you can actually move, but dancers can. So when they work together and they uh, remap out again the different ways that humans can move and humans can push themselves, it actually gets them, the scientists, to understand more about human ability. It's a really interesting, like, whatever the reason that is, but it was really interesting collaboration. I think also that it is not not even here in conversation, whether at university or perhaps if you're who please make sure that you go back and talk about this, you know, really talk about this. Um, uh, uh, the cross disciplinary, right? It's so scary. So because we are so divided right now, like in your art, your art, your science, your science. So the art don't really look at the science, the science, you know, I know everything that art people are doing is party, you know, so yeah, man, you know. But there isn't enough opportunities for you to really understand what cross-disciplinary really is. So you would never have considered something to do with um, uh, 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 how bakau, for example, grow, that movement of growth, for example, and how is it moving again into the water, for example. Uh, all these interesting things to be put back into the kind of work that you want to be putting up. Or medicine, for example. We're talking about cancer growth. How cancer is growing, it's really interesting, there was an institute um, uh, that I came across in um, uh, Japan and they were uh, using um, so two different artists to dance with each other to bounce off how cancer cells grow. Because they didn't really understand, so how else can, can, can two, two cells move to, to, to map out the growth of cancer cells? So it, it's also really interesting for them to understand, ah, so if I relax and I just our movement is just based on each other 
I project you, you project me, eh? and they see what way it takes us. So that was what they were looking at. They were so like, you mean, this is movement. Look, look, look at this movement. How, how? Yeah, because it's not something that's within their realm, right? So this kind of collaboration. How, next, do we then forge this collaboration? That's the other issue. Sure, you talk about that there is a lot of money, perhaps. More, more grant money in science than it would be in art. But I don't think artists Barani have the courage to even do this. A, they don't know. B, even they know, they weren't sure. And C, this is really not how they're imagining the future because this is not a future we know. Yeah. So how, how do we do I this? I think um, for, for, again, I uh, approach it from the point of view of education. And what we find is that, you know, in all universities, when dance has been put into a university, we get so concerned about credit hours, contact hours, we get so so consumed by the fact that they have to do, you know, how much is it, 130 credits to get a degree or diploma or whatever, you know, uh, and therefore it's X amount of face-to-face -face and then Y amount of student learning and therefore that equals to what. We're so obsessed about this that we actually don't give students any space. Yeah, I think they need space to dream and they need space to think, to imagine and to create. So one of the sort of the trending sort of uh, terminology that we use in our college is white space. So it's like your mind is a, a blackboard that you get, yeah, a canvas that you can draw anything on. So what we're trying to do is to find students spaces where uh, they are free and that means that means students from other schools, music, film and technology, film and TV, etc. are also free all at the same time. And then they can get together in little choreo labs for three hours a week, let's say. And, okay, you don't have to come up with a product. You just have to go and be with each other in groups and play and see what happens. But of course, the technique teacher says, oh no, no, they have three hours free. Oh no, they have to practice their pirouettes and do their petit lego and run. They have to do another te technique class. They have to do cartwheels. So, you know, people are very possessive about their time, uh, especially if it relates to their own field. You know, the pianists want to practice more. But this is something that I'm not saying we have managed to do it, but it's a philosophy that is trying to guide the school in that particular direction. And if I come back to Malaysia and whenever I have a chance to talk about it, this is the thing that I want to talk about. You know, I don't want to look at MQA documents anymore for the rest of my life. Because the people who do MQA documents, and I did for many years, have no, and I mean zero idea of arts education. You know? So, this is really the sad situation that we are being forced into. And then we cannot grow. So UITM just wants to start. And I'm giving Farul a really hard time because I said, you know, you don't even have studios and you want to start a dance department. You know, this is 2020. Come on. People are building studios in outer space. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> so this is it. Yeah, so looking at creation. So education and creation and the need for white space within uh, within institutions, definitely, but beyond institutions, because not everybody follows that kind of a system to become an artist. So where do you find those kind of spaces, you know? So, uh, there's a lot of grant money in Hong Kong. I mean, I, my mouth is drooling all the time when I see it, you know? And we're talking millions, yeah? Uh, millions of ringgit available for artists all the time. So, also spaces and building spaces. And so I know that Kaki City had a great initiative to try to find these kind of black box spaces, white box spaces, so that different kind of art can take place. So it's not always sitting down in a proscenium theatre and being so separated from the performers, but to be able to be a part of more interactive. So in creation, yeah, in creation, what is the most crazy thing you've ever done with technology, for example? Like, um, you know, behind the scenes, the kind of machine, the kind of synthesizer, I'm just saying. That, that you work with, the, you know, the, the way music we put together today compared to even just two years ago is very different. Yeah. Uh, the speed is different, the sound the is different. is different, the vocabulary is different, my gosh. I'm so glad I have a 17 year old brother to teach me all the slang that's going on right now. <laughs> I'm like, what is a fleek? <laughs> what is fleek? What is that? Freak. Fleek. What is fleek? <laughs> it's like on your eyeliner, it's fleek. It's not fleek. Right? Right. Yeah. I know. Yeah, exactly. 
But for me, I think the craziest thing I've ever done in technology was actually really putting myself out there. Because, you know, at the time, like I said, having anything online to think that it would generate any sort of beneficial, especially in the Asian family, where you can only choose certain things to be, doctor, lawyer, accountant, IT engineer, right? To so even talk about that, you want to dwell into the arts was a challenge enough to some, you know, to start up like the, 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 the bravery to tell my parents, like, I think I'm going to do this. Um, and I think the decision to be brave, to be that vulnerable, to put yourself out there was kind of So what do you think about what, like, I'm going to go crazy and all this, sorry. Like what Taylor Swift is doing, for example. What is she doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know how she was like, you know, the uh, number I need here. I don't know what was behind her decision. The calling, calling out all her ex-boyfriends. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that I have no idea. But I'm talking about how she would define how you know um, her music has been put out, for example. How the need of putting together a record, mm -hmm. for example. And she doesn't do that. Beyonce right. as well, right? Yeah, as well. Yeah, right? Yeah. The way they use different platforms to, yeah, yeah. to their ability. So they will go to Instagram. They will go to um, iTunes, for example, and strike this deal themselves and say that yeah. I can pull this to you, but you have to give me this because I'm going to do this. So the way they think, the way they reimagine what platforms can be for them. Sure, I mean, okay, may I be honest though, they have a team thinking for them. So, yeah. you know, a team of uh, young people or people who are in suits, people who read algorithms and data and, you know, the capital to do that, obviously. And they have the name and the star power already to make decisions like that. Like, I'm going to pull out all of my catalog on Spotify. I'm not going to be on Spotify anymore. Although I think she's back on Spotify yeah, she now. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Beyonce is, you know, queen. She can do whatever she wants. Yes, of okay? course. She can. She, she can drop a single right now and I'll be like, excuse me, I got it. I'm going to say, is going to slay next. Um, but, you know, I think it. Uh, which is, you know, coming back to one of the first questions is like, how can we utilize technology in the sense I think it's it's important for us to, you know, now verbalizing it. I think also it's just me telling myself that we should keep ourselves updated, especially if we do, if we are the type of artists that want social media or technology platforms to be an outlet for us to share our work. Um, but it does take, it's not just, you know, you put yourself out there and then boom, like five million plays. It's not, because there's also strategies behind it, it's timing behind it. And, you know, how you have to be intuitive about it. And there's a lot of planning behind, you know, something as, as extreme as, you know, like trying to be a part of creating the next movement. And honestly, it takes a really strong team to be on your side, for you to be able to brainstorm and see what you can do about it next. So what would be the one thing you would tell all the different artists that we have in this room um, today about creation, uh, about digital, about creation? What would be the one thing you would tell them? Keep creating, I think. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, what not to be afraid of, for example. Do, do they have to be worried about how many likes they're getting? Do they have to be, no. you know, because that, talk about users or how can we... Honestly, when I started on YouTube, I didn't, I, just half of my face, this is back when I was still under the moniker Coco Kaina. And, right. um, That's and, right. Right, okay. <laughs> um, and um, it was just half of my face and just me singing because I was aware that YouTube was a visual outlet, but I wanted to also force not force, but have a more focus on the audio aspect and the lyrical content on my songs. And I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell my friends about it, and I didn't have any expectations. It's besides. like the secret superstar that can be movies. I think like, that's oh my god, that's so amazing. Really? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
And what I don't feel enough of is that there is kind of a team support for this kind of thing, you know. So it's like, oh, you're doing it, so that's fine. Uh, but I'm not going to like like your video because I'm not going to make you more popular than me, you know. <laughs> yeah, with oh, Kira. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I don't know, but I, I I'm trying to figure it out too. But at least these are initiatives I I, I see that people are taking to put their work out, you know. So. And I always tell them that, yes, I know I don't have a wife and I don't have a husband and I don't have children, so I have all the time in the world to do the arts, right? But, you know, I have other things I like to do too, you know? I want to know what Aishwarya Rai is doing today. <laughs> I need to know, you know, before I can carry on my day, you know? So I need to know sports, I need to know the tennis scores, I need to know, you know, who's bombing who, you know, on a serious note. I mean, I need to know why, what happened in Sri Lanka. I need to know a lot of things, but on top of that, I need to dance and I need to create and so on. So it's about wanting it badly enough to create those things, you know, and um, and and that's my advice to young people. And, and all of you who are not artists, my advice is please come and watch our shows. And buy tickets to watch it, you know? So I think this is very important uh, that my, my friends, and this is a very good example. Oh, you have a show today. Okay, la. what time you finish? <laughs> 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 you know, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I've been living with this for 40 years of my life. <laughs> All my family and friends are like that. They're not interested in the show, they just want to know whether I'm free afterwards. <laughs> That's life, you know what I mean? But I guess the ones who are not artists here today can also decide to perhaps consider forming that team to support that one artist that you truly believe in so that that artist can grow further. Um, uh, give them that team. I think it's quite difficult for an artist to do everything by themselves. And I don't, I'm, I'm quite sure. Yeah, I'm quite sick in my brain. Yeah, so you, you, you're, you're not, if you're not a business person, you're not a business person. You're not going to be able to sell your art. So as an artist, you should just focus on content creation, let someone else do the selling of your art. But you kind of need to also talk to enough people so that they will then, okay lah, I vouch for you, okay, help yourself. But so you kind of need to have to talk to enough people and put your words out there. You know, so it's not just where I am today, what food I'm eating that you're posting on Instagram or whatever. It's also about what you're trying to say and trying to reach out to and who you're trying to engage. And those things are also important. Okay, questions on the floor, from the floor. Siapa ada questions? Mesti ada kan? No, 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 come on, come on. Clearly must be some clear. Okay, Abby. Abby is a really interesting person. She's like one of the poets that, you know, amazing poets that I know. And then and then she decides to take herself off social media. Off, okay? Off the green, pull herself out. And she has more followers than me at one point. And then, did she pull herself out simply because she felt that, oh, I feel like, uh, what was your word you use? Uh, you know, and also you feel like you're prostitution whichever and and but you and, and now she's building it again and you are still at I don't know how many hundred people following yeah. maybe that's not important yeah. to you yeah. but it's interesting about how polarized you're thinking yeah. just using okay. an example all right thank you uh, I think uh, I just want to ask a question because uh, most of us in this generation and actually your generation which generation I mean, actually your generation <laughs> but we we are very used to oral history so we use that as a teladan. But now in the digital sphere, people only see the good things. They don't hear about kesusah payahan somebody to go where and how. You know, they don't see that trail of how your journey is. All they see is makanan sedap. That you say, uh, I success, I cantik, I apa. So how do we change? this kind of communication and actually share the susapaya so people, the younger people start the guru, you know, start using this power then. I, I so thoroughly in that jawaban. <laughs> My personal jawaban to that is sebab itulah we artists, you faham tak? Because you artists, you faham what is missing in the society and you need to then use that to reflect in the kind of work that you, you have to start talking about the hardship you are going through and then have this conversation with more artists so that they are part of your movement and they will now talk about the hardship that they are going through and you guys are sharing your stuff, blah blah blah, putting out there so that people are looking at you guys and saying that hey, there is a real process here it's not just all the wonderful good things, you know uh, 
you wake up in the middle of the night also look good, you know, and, and you always look like you're making money, you don't have a job, also you still flying first class, how does that happen, right? But it, it, it means they don't understand the deal that they make at the back, the kind of pain that they have to pay back to get that first class ticket of this client, for example. But, but you knowing that, you should be the one that's going to start this journey, start talking about this hardship, and co-op as many other artists together because now you can is so, to join this movement and they talk about their hardship and everybody now then will talk about hardship. That's my short <laughs> answer. And also talk about what a great pleasure it is when you get to do what you want to do. Even if it's difficult. Yes. Even if it's for a short while. And I my dream was to dance in London professionally. Oh. Yeah, not be a busker in London. <laughs> to dance on a proper stage in London. And you know, for somebody who started dance and ballet and everything very late in my life, uh, I did it. And I can remember every single moment of that experience, you know. So everybody, including my teachers, some, some of my teachers in Malaysia, they said, Oh, come on, Joseph, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell. You know, Salji in Naraka, no chance. So, I said, but it's okay, it's my dream. So, what is the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen? It doesn't work out. I fail. So what? You know, I'm not bothering you. I'm not asking you for money. I might. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, as long as you talk to yourself, you can do it. So, it's your dream and your plan. So, I think it's very interesting uh, when we talk about storytelling in Singapore. Now, there's uh, Kamini Ramachandran, I think her name is. Uh, and she's actually developed a whole storytelling community. And that's what she does. And she's introduced storytelling in La Salle and Nafa. And she goes, you know, stands in the corner and creates people and brings them together to tell stories about their forefathers and interesting chita chita longing or whatever, you know. So there is that, uh, that practice and that tradition that people don't want to lose as well. So I, I, I think for myself, I. Every opportunity I have, I never say no. So even if it means flying down from Hong Kong to talk to, you know, 25 people, I will do it, you know? Can we talk about this? Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, if I can talk to 3,000 people, I also will. I take every opportunity I have to do whatever I can to talk about the arts because people really, really don't know enough about it. What is the difference between someone like me who's... who's Bread and butter is from dance. Between somebody else who works as a lawyer or an accountant or a doctor, we have doctors in the dance industry, who get the bulk of their money from dance and then uh, from the uh, from their business or their profession, and then dance on the side. Although they dance very well, so it's not an issue of how well they dance, but they can afford to dance for less money because it's okay. Now you don't need to pay me because my job will pay me. But unfortunately, if, I, if you don't pay me, then I don't know what I'm going to do. It's your life anyway. That's right. So this is something that I think it's very important that we do talk about. We must talk about creation, stories, journeys, and so on. And I'm, I'm, I'm often encouraging young people to say, create your own little seminar. Now, you know, in the old days, we just had Aswara, right? But now we have so many other institutions. And then we have mm, mm, graduates who worked with me who are teaching in all these different institutions. So once, a long time ago, 20 years ago, I remember Zainal works at UMS, and I said, you know that thing where the guy, the, the what movies that from? Evil. Yeah, Dr. Uh, evil, which is what they call me, actually. <laughs> so I said, what I want is world domination, you know? So world <laughs> domination, <laughs> yeah, but through the arts. And you know, I, what, what I just share some beautiful stories. Um, and one of the most unforgettable stories of my life in this very fractured world that we live in, is when a whole group of Malay Muslim students went to a Chinese girl's father's funeral and they walked around the coffin, they took the incense, they put it there, they are all Muslim boys and girls who were unthreatened by somebody else's beliefs. And we all stand in a circle and we all say our prayers together and, and you know I'm a bit irreverent about prayers and all the Malays will be like that. You know how the mother do, and then I'll be doing this to the person next to me, and then I will do this suddenly, and then I will do the sign of the cross many times. But it doesn't freak out my students, you know? It doesn't. They are so used to it. They love it, they embrace it. But what's happening in Malaysia now, we're all so scared. You know, everybody's so terrified of 
anybody else who has another practice, you know? So this is really, I think the artist has power to change this. I really believe the artist has power to change this, you know? So, uh, it, it, this is the role that you play. So it's not just about creating beautiful art. Yes, you can. And why not? We love it too. But it's also about creating powerful art. Uh, but art that can make a difference. Yeah. So your narrative actually does make a difference. Yes, please. Another have a question. Hi. Well, the reason I came here is not just because I love art, but it's so good to meet you, Joseph. Nice to meet you, I'm Lisa. I come from a family of um, artists also. My late uncle is Azmi Mustafa, whom you know as uh, Ali Seytan. His father was the writer of Atak Gunting Atak Rumbia, uh, Mustafa Kamenyasi. So, coming from a family of artists, um, art is part of my life. I am considered very liberal within my family of in-laws and in UIA, but I am considered very conservative in my own family because I wear the tudo, you know, I take care of my son, all that, alhamdulillah. Um, what I learned from here is that lawyers and artists are so similar. <laughs> because we struggle, succeed or die trying, honestly, especially after I left Bandagara and joined private practice and also in translation. So, what I see, especially from the context of digital technology, um, for the legal scenario, we, we experience that legal disruption. You know, people don't have to go to legal firms and seek advice because they can get a template of the contract or a summary of legal advice on the internet. Okay? And uh, I think also in performing arts, as a lawyer, I put on my legal hat and I say, okay, yeah, Especially when you expose yourself and you make comments on Facebook and whatnot, you're exposing yourself to risk, liabilities, obligations, and what are your rights? Especially if you or your team does not advise you um, on your obligations before performance, for example. And what happens after that? What happens if you don't pay tax? Oops, right? <laughs> so that's one part as a lawyer. But then again, also as a lawyer, um, I see there is this um, struggle, especially between senior partners, for example, the equity partners and the junior lawyers, because you need to get jobs. You know, people are getting very competitive. Um, we have the expertise, but another boutique firm has that same expertise, and they are asking for a lower quote. So you're talking about creativity, creating yourself, making yourself visible, but then the limited by certain requirements of the bar council to make ourselves visible, for example. And also, we are talking about how to make profit, but at the same time, how to contribute to the community. So, I think it's all about relationship, and I can see there is good potential where lawyers and artists collaborate to, you know, to know what's going on in society, to use digital technology to make these issues come out, um, being someone who was trained in UIA, um, I know there are so many creative people um, in this um, Islamic, for example, Islamic trained community because um, what we worry is that uh, many people make their own ishtihad. They don't, and, and they make their own comments that creates a lot of confusion. You know, and when I translate the birds, the conference of the birds, it's written by, um, what's his name, Farid bin Atta, who's the predecessor of Jalal bin Rumi, the poet. And in that book, it's, he's a Sufi, he's from Persia, and he's a Sunni Sufi. Because you know, Persians, they have the Shia and the Sunnis. It's amazing. There's a lot of material on Islamic history, on traditions that may not really match Islamic tradition, but because they're culture and social issues that happened today and happened many years back. This is 12th century stories, scandals and whatnot. So I really propose that artists have a look at all this Islamic literature, for example, collaborate with the people of the know and uh, other uh, art supporters to bring them up, especially on digital technology. Thank you. That's interesting, I thought. Okay. Um, yes, you have something to comment or to ask. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Omar, and I previously mentioned Marco Sinek. But the reason why I call myself that is because me and the few artists I work with, we don't really stick to 
provide us something. We have more with uh, sketching, doodling, poetry, spoken word, illustrations, uh, visual displays, song, stuff like that. And generally, the storytelling could be a field where we tell a story, but how we do so doesn't really have its own discipline. And my question is, for those who have a discipline, we call ourselves an uh, illustrator, we call ourselves a uh, textile worker, or we're working with like, uh, some specific stuff. You have that thread, that, 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 that line that you want to follow. But for those who don't really have a specific discipline, nor do they want to choose one, is there a way for us to figure out what our next step is? That's my question. Repeat your question the last part one more time. So, for those who don't have a specific discipline, how do we move forward? Like, if he doesn't want to call himself an illustrator, he doesn't want to call himself a visual art display, uh, um, uh, what does he put in his resume? Uh, or maybe he doesn't need a resume. But what does he do next? I'm, I'm really not sure um, whether it is very important to classify yourself as, as one thing. Yeah? So, uh, I think it's really about seeking like-minded people who are willing to explore and willing to experiment. And sometimes, those kind of conversations can happen anywhere, over dinner, it can happen, you know, at a party, or in a football field, or whatever. And it's about exchanging cards, uh, and, like, I, I still do that all the time. I mean, I'm ridiculously OCD about people I meet, and, you know, making sure that I know who they are and what they do. Uh, especially if they do anything that's remotely artistic. So I'm, um, oh, so you know, you, so you just kind of, the, the, the thought sort of stays in your head and it, it's a percolate, so it's a, like an incubator. And it's like one day, I think I want to work with so and so, you know. So I think this is the way that you have to, to approach that person and then eventually say, you know, I have this idea, or do you have an idea, do you think we can work, work together? That would be the that would be my suggestion. But find these kinds of platforms where you can meet these kinds of people. There are very interesting things that are happening in Kuala Lumpur now in little pockets and little uh, little oasis and spaces like, you know, the, what is it, the Zhongzhang building or whatever they call it? Yeah. I love that building. Yeah, the one in... I uh, find it there a lot. To you. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, where is it again? Uh, in the middle of the Kelvin. Kelvin. Kampo Kanta. Yeah, so lots of creative people use that space for all sorts of different things. I see you there tonight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But basically, yeah, if I can just kind of give you what I think, in the startup world, yeah, yeah, uh, in the tech, you know, in people who start up. So, they don't really say what they are. They, they never say what they are. So, if you go to a really young one, one that, you know, very energetic type of uh, event or whichever, you will find people just passing out different kind of material that will talk about what their last project is and what they like to do moving forward. Or they will go around talking about, I don't, you don't have to know what I've done before, but I'm looking for somebody who would want to do this with me. Do you, are you that someone? If you are not that someone, do you know someone who could want to do this, who potentially want to do this and do it with me? So more and more people are not going to be confined to what they need to be called. Of course, some uh, people, old, young, whatever, will come to you and say, Tapi you tak focus lah. I tak faham. What are you actually? Do not be, you know, uh, troubled by this kind of comments because that's how they define themselves. It's not wrong either. It's just how they define themselves and how they're so used to it. But if you don't really want to take the, 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 the different route or maybe what you think is different for you to, to a lot of your other industry is okay, sure. It's really, really okay. So I think the, the, the point here is like, okay, uh, Joseph was saying, you need to kind of find a different kind of platform to have this conversation to really understand, hey, I like what this person is doing, the way this person is doing what she or he is doing, and I want to, I want to emulate or I want to be, I want to add value and be better than that. So those are the things you can find that you mentioned. May I also? Yes, please. Um, I think right now, we kind of live in a generation where we create our own jobs. It's because we have so much freedom to be whatever we want. And then that's why people say millennials are lazy because they don't have focus or we have we're just spoiled for choices at this point. Right? It's like hey, you're an illustrator, you're a fine arts artist, you create this, you create that. In the end like we do live in a time where we've created more art than anything and you've been discovering more different types of art, more different types of music, more different types of stories are being told because we do 
have the outlets and the platforms to do that. So for me, sometimes I, you know, people ask me what I do, I say, I'm just a storyteller with melodies because at the end of the day, like, that really is the core of what I'm doing. And people ask me, like, oh, so what kind of music do you make? And I'm like, it's not up to me. Sometimes I let the songs write themselves. You know, if a song wants to sound like a brunch song, that's how it's going to sound like. If it sounds like a jazz song, I guess I do that too. If it's folk, uh, I'm like, okay. But, like I said, you know, I just love music and I'm a vessel and it's just not up to me like you. I feel like right now we have the freedom to say, my style is no style. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, next. Well, I'm right here, I'm right here, I'm right here, I'm right here, wherever the microphone is right here. Fight, fight, fight. Hi, this is Louis again. Um, uh, again? <laughs> yeah, because uh, Dr. Zanzali just, just mentioned here, yeah, I must confess, when, when, when I first got the invite for this event, uh, so I asked Dr. Gonzalez, so what time you finish? <laughs> <laughs> but because I live around the corner and I was told there was tea here, I <laughs> feel <laughs> But anyway, um, coming back to the, uh, the, 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 the issue today, the, 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 the thing that's playing in my mind is first, the topic, the topic is beyond digital. Um, what Dr. Gonzalez had mentioned, and from, from uh, how I would summarize what he said in Malaysia, is that we're not even digital yet, uh, as far as performing arts are concerned. Um, what Ziyami says is she's actually using the, the platform. But my question is, it's beyond that. What is beyond that? What's beyond digital? I mean, um, the reason why I'm asking it is because um, in my profession, the fear is artificial intelligence. That's where the fear is for a lawyer. Because a lot of our work is no longer being done by lawyers. By the time, and I'm glad I'm very close to uh, Gonzalez's age, that I will soon retire and uh, I don't have to worry so much. But it is really happening today. What used to take us a month to do, what we call a due diligence, which means to review documents, is now being taken by a law firm in Malaysia for in less than three hours. So it's artificial intelligence. So my, my question is, is that going to be the future of the performing arts, the music industry? You know, um, are we going to see that? Because I'm not against it. In fact, I think it may be good, it may even be better. But you will always have people like me who will still have vinyl records and will still listen to them. You know, so what is the future? What is beyond digital in your industry? Happy 29th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, I collect vinyl records too. I'm a nostalgic person at heart. Uh, I appreciate sounds when it used to just be focused on sound and poetry and lyrics. I do feel that um, unfortunately, in the music sphere, AI has taken over. You can see it in, our, in the ways that production works now. There's many, many, many digitally manipulated songs that you're already hearing, you have been hearing for the past, since the early thousands. And now, you don't really have to be a singer you can just, you know, someone who's a household brand name now, top 40 artists, we're not going to say who and who, but they just go into the studio and they're like, okay, here's what you should sing. And they just go sing one line, ah, uh, like that. And there are programs now where the engineers draw in to make it sound like they're going, ha, ah, so, to me, when I first found out about that, I was really heartbroken, actually, because, like I said, I, you know, I like the purity of what music used to sound like. You know, the songs that I listen to are all below 1979. Everything from blues to classical to jazz to folk, disco, and now city pop. So I believe it's one piece. But, AI, I think this is a, one of those progress that we cannot fight, we cannot change because it's progressively becoming greater than what we're told it actually can do. So you're not embracing it? Sorry? You're, you're fighting it? I have to embrace it. 
Because, you know, as the age-old saying goes, you can't beat them, join them. However, we just have to really kind of educate ourselves into what the formula really is, and then use that and put our own essence and stylistics into it. That's for music, I mean, this, but... I think, um, it, because the body is the instrument for the art form of dance, uh, I think if you speak to any dance dancer, dance choreographer, teacher, they will always say that because that is the basic tool, that there will always be a space for the body to keep being the main method of conveying conversation or information or communication. Uh, however, all these other aspects of digital technology or going beyond using AI. Perhaps I just saw a piece of dance from Taiwan where the dancer was actually dancing with a robot. You know? So it didn't move me at all. You know? <laughs> I was, uh, I, sorry, uh, I was at a function recently where all the dancers were robots. Of course they looked like um, um, you know you know um, uh, lost in space that, that kind of robot so it, it wasn't very impressive. But you know it, it's 2019 now. In 30 years' time, they may look at you and I. Oh, yes. so sorry, not you and I, but you know, yes. better looking people. <laughs> you know? And they will probably be better than humans. Yes. So I, I'm not against it, I'm not I'm embracing it, I, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm just curious. Because they may be able to perform better yes. than the body. Yes, there was that very famous robot called Sophia. 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 Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yes. So she looks like a real yeah. human being, and it's really scary, right? For me. So, um, so maybe one day Sophia, well, I'm very sure right now Sophia dances better than me already. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But I don't, for me and the sort of the purists, you know, I think it's still about watching the body perform in all its imperfections as well. Yeah. You know, and I think that makes it beautiful. And I remember somebody once told me about uh, Liza Minnelli singing some great song that she sang and she you know, did a huge thing and she sang a wrong note or something, but it was so beautiful. It's character. I always say that what if Nina Simone or Janice Joplin or Billie Holiday was still alive right now? Yes. Like, would you want to auto tune her? First of all, I'd be really scared to auto tune Nina Simone. Okay. Just look at me and be like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, yes. but, you know, I, for me, I, I feel that too, because those are the characters, yes. the flaws that make you human. And I think. The forecast of music next, because right now there's a lot of hip hop and you know, which is great, but it's also a lot of skinny man, skinny man, you know. But um, a DJ friend of mine actually said uh, that he for forecasts uh, actual instrument music making a comeback. <laughs> For something real, people are thirsty to hear actual guitars. I can't tell you how many times I've been in, in, okay, in America, top studios, right? Nicki Minaj is upstairs recording her album. And you go into the studio and I'm like, okay, wow, super impressive, super spacious, like state of the art consoles, everything. And I go in there and I'm like, I don't see any, a single instrument. And they go like, everything you need, right here, baby, 88 keys. What you need? You want a top up? <laughs> you know? What you need? You want a sitar? Everything right here. Everything is digital, you know, but that's not how I was, actually. Like, for me, when I go into the studio, I need it to be different kinds of instruments because every instrument has its own soul and has its own personality and sound. That's how I create textures. So, right now, for me, Unfortunately, like people ask me, so Zuri, what do you listen to now? Like, what's on the radio that's good for you? And I don't know actually, to be honest, because right now I feel like I'm like taking a pause, like a break from what is considered music right now, actually. And I retract back to the root of it all. And then I'm gonna like be an avid fan again when actual instruments, real instruments are back on the radio. I think, Louis, if we go back to talking about why you love vinyl so much, right? For example, 
And it's somehow when you were growing up, this is what you were exposed to and this is what you loved. And I, I will then tie that back into education. And if we can then educate young people on a, you know, even if it's arts appreciation, but not an arts program in a course, in a school. But for them to love the feel of, you know, the rabba, or to, to really feel the, the bells of the, the southern hail. You know, so that they fall in love with these real, tangible things yeah. that they will want to then. Oh, I remember how wonderful that felt. Eh? So, the experience of you actually going on stage and performing, being the body that performs, would be very different for you actually sort of uh, manipulating a machine to do that performance. Right? So that visceral experience of the body is, I think, critical in this conversation at least. You know? So from the point of view of the organizer, just to answer your question, when we ask the question of your digital, our call to the artist is really A, to first consider what the digital space and what the digital era is bringing so that they can be uplifted almost immediately. And B, come together more in collaboration and work so that we are seeing more, not necessarily using technology to create our art form, but create more because now we have the platform to do it and remind people how wonderful our creation created by human beings really are so that they understand, oh, I'm going to, you know, this is a variation to the things that's being offered. So I'm not saying that we, uh, uh, AI music is going to be it, it is going to be big because it's an industry. Because people with money can afford to make a lot more music coming out of it, and therefore make a lot more money. So it's an industry. Sure, it, it's, it's trade. But at the end of the day, there will be a lot more people, and a, as long as there are a lot more supply of artwork, of work, of body of work, body of content that you, is being put out, when they are reminded, yes, there is an AI music, but also look at this, non-machine stuff created purely by experiences of human beings that we should also be looking at. We're not saying we should take over that. No, that's not a competition, that's not the whole point. But if we're not even having this conversation about what digital is doing for and maybe how we can, you know, use them in our own way as an artist, um, then we can never talk about going beyond. So that's really why we're talking about this. A good question so that I can answer it. You have a question? The yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> I'm waiting for this question for so long. I said, oh my god, what's my turn? Okay, it's not, I mean, I have three questions. Uh, I, I have three questions. Uh, Core lecture questions, you know, from different different. And uh, first of all, I'm a choreographer, dancer, and also currently teaching you at UATM, dance. And going to open a new program, Diploma in Dance, Technology, and Drama. So we are trying, and Joseph is one of the external panel who suggested a lot of things to me and like knocking me every day and yelling at me every day or so. <laughs> Alright, so first of all, thank you to Gatisini for having this such a beautiful and wonderful event. But unfortunately, I'm quite sad, a little bit sad, but not really sad because I think this is such a good event. For me, everyone should be here, the expert whoever called themselves a champion for the arts, where are they? And I'm quite sad you know, to have all this kind of thing. And I have a life, I'm really live with it because I want people to watch after this, how sad we are. To have people who fly from Hong Kong, come on, you know? Fly from Hong Kong just for this event. And see, you know, we have a very, very interesting artist. You know, but people doesn't appreciate so much. And I have, I'm happy also because we have a writer. Uh, uh, from a media, maybe, you know, and you can write a lot of things about this kind of thing. And for me personally, what we are lacking is we don't have a social media expert or uh, uh, what we call who cover a lot for celebrities, for example. We don't have that kind of thing. We need all that kind of people. But the question is why we need all these kind of people? Why? And we have an influencer from the Instagram and we always need to ask help from them to promote our show, right? And I often call Shuki Tree, you know, like, Shu, we have a show, can you promote Kati City? Because Kati City now have loads of followers and etc, etc, etc. And we need all these kind of people. Again, Kati City have a lot of followers, but why we cannot have all 
a lot of these followers to come for this small and beautiful event. You know, so this, that is a big question that I'm, 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 I'm so concerned and where are we going to bring this to, onto the next stage? We have a lot of champions, but we are not championing anything yet in the industry. And it's, I'm, I'm 31 years old, I'm quite sad. I always tell Joseph, every single day that I contact Joseph, I say, I am frustrating and I'm giving up. And Joseph said, I'm 59 years old, Farida Meskel, Marikens already how many years have been, in, uh, have been in the industry? They survive. You know, everyone has their own agenda, but my question is to all of you also, which agenda that you're going to like gather everyone and this is the one main core agenda that we're going to bring to the commentary and promote and sell this. For example, because we have a lot of different bodies but a lot of different agenda for our personal interests. But what is formulation? That's my question. And the second question is, um, are we speak the same language? If yes, why? And if no, why? And the third question is, do you feel... Um, oh, no, I have said two questions only. Okay, okay two questions only. Because, again, I have to say that we are... I mean, not you guys, but we are a millennial kids. What? Who are very expert. <laughs> <laughs> Who are very expert in social media, who are very expert in everything, you know, but yet we are losing. We keep losing with the mainstream people and we remain as a marginalized forever. That's why we cannot cross borders, we cannot have an inter uh, interdisciplinary crisscross, we cannot have that. Even though we have a Naiwen, Katisini, or My Dance Alliance, or World Dance Alliance, or whoever, even though we bring Akram Khan, Hoffer Shakhtar, and all these people in Malaysia, but if we don't have support from the industry, like writers, media, and everything, we will lose. Trust me. Thank you. I'm sad. 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 The audience is here. That little tiny phone thing that, that's driving all this conversation out. So we're not, we're no longer, Kakisini is no longer hung up about making sure our events is attended by the top people or 200 people because we are respectful of how everybody chooses to spend their Saturday afternoon. We're okay with that. We're doing it in the Kawasan Kurumahan like this. If not accessible, it's something that I would never do before because I would challenge my team. What are the data? Dengan pakai apa? Alat ni mana? Ha? Taxi mana? How? When, when you stop? How, how do you tell people what this building is? That was how we used to think. But today, as long as this conversation happens, the need of this conversation is more important than the need of having all the dance breaks sitting here. Or it, because this is not a conversation they want to have, for example. But putting now they're having it on record, putting it on Facebook, whatever, live, and later on it can be downloaded, is good today. So it's really up to us to see what platform we're using. Therefore, using that platform and going. But this conversation is not just here, it's not just us talking to you. Because after this, when you have tea <laughs> and have conversation with each other and talk to each other about how, you know, oh, I, I don't want to define my career, I want to define what I am, but you know, I like what you do, can we do something together? That is priceless. And why is that priceless? Because you took so much effort to get here. Because what would you be doing if you're not here? You'd be on your phone. Somewhere, wherever. You'll be on your phone. Anyway, so being here means you have taken that extra effort. And that also means that you would want to create something more out of this conversation today. And, and that is the beauty of what we're doing. That's also not thing happening. Uh, I will leave how sad you are to your teacher. Your teacher will reply to all your sad things. But our reply is just for Kakisini, we're not anymore hung up. We used to be driving, how many people coming, I used to be telling Mr. Petri, hey, um, upper, my SRP, RSVP, Rapa, how many, how many, you talk to which university, blah, blah, blah. It's always been about that. We see commentary and passing people, you know, but we don't do that. That's not what we want. We want people who want to come. And, you know, it's not easy to come up here. I, I, even I don't know. Well, I mean, it works because like, that is me always promoting every single show. You know, Mr. Petri did such a great job. We do like promoting you. Yeah, so the other kind of thing that you were talking about
about that you feel like you're sad that there isn't one body or one voice that is going to move things, you know, for the for the industry. I want to tell you in a free world, please do not expect that. Yeah. Why do you want one voice when you can have a million? Yeah, sure. Everybody can get to do whatever they want to do anyway. You don't want to follow one voice. It's freedom. I tell you, it's freedom. When you are so clinical and you have one voice, like Singapore, I didn't say that. But <laughs> then you are complaining about why I don't have freedom to do this, I don't have freedom to do that. I don't have, oh, look at Malaysia, they're so good, they can do whatever they want. See, they're saying that. So I'm thinking, if, if you want to champion something, go and champion it. Find people, I'm sure people will come and say, yeah, yeah, okay, we champion it with you, no problem. But is that one voice of the entire industry? Does it need to be? It doesn't. I've learned this apart. So it doesn't matter. Just go with the You don't need to talk You don't need to talk Okay, talk about do. You don't need one thing to represent. And the government, to be really honest, while I really salute the idea that Hong Kong is doing amazing things, Singapore is doing amazing things, Australia is doing amazing things, everybody is doing amazing things, where is Malaysia? They are amazing things. They are. Maybe not what we want, but they are amazing things that's being done. And there are children dancing in the hutan, in the hutan. like the kampung area of the school, simply because they have art programs in, in various different places which are funded by the government. It's because that principal decided to use it for the arts. Totally, really up to the principal. Again, it's a completely different kind of politics, right? But there are a lot of amazing things. Oh, there are. It's just that maybe we want different things. We want to fight for different things. So, how do we fight? We fight, not huh? Each one of us fight. Tak ayah nak satu benda fight together. Not important. I've done this so I know. Okay, sorry. I'm sad about it. I'm not sure what you're sad about now. Are you still sad? No, I'm not sad anymore. You see? It's so powerful, this teacher. You are not sad. <laughs> the difficulty, yes, I mean, if I tell you, you know, that I spent days and weeks and months in the UK, for example, not having any food, not having any money for the train tickets or stealing food, and, you know, I've done it all, you know, but that's, that's part of why, what I chose, you know, but I also remember the great things that make me very happy, you know, the things that make me very satisfied and the journey that I've taken that involved a lot of risk, you know, you, you go out of your comfort zone and say, you know, I really want to do this because I believe in doing this. Then uh, that's what you have to do. So if you as now you had said, yes, if you're waiting for copies to Nietzsche and Dana, JKK and etc. 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 et cetera, to all get together and then speak the same language, I think that's going to be very challenging. Ideally, what I think would be great is if all these different bodies at least knew of what the other people were doing. I think that's very good already, and so that we don't try to replicate, you know, so I think replication is a problem in Malaysia. I think, uh, yeah, I think this is really is something that we would, I mean, I would love to have the opportunity to ask people to address, but uh, there's nobody from JKK and here, uh, but for example, the Department of Arts and Culture kind of want to do everything. So it does make a, a challenge for other people. There are some great things that they're doing. Uh, and so on. So, but how do we synergize? I think this would be very useful. So, one of the things was, yeah. So, you have all these different universities today, all wanting to have the same dance program. So, I said, you no. Know, for me, I think University of Malaya should focus on postgraduate research. I think University of Pendidikan Sultan Idris should do dance and uh, arts and whatever for teachers. Aswara can concentrate on choreography and performance. I'm only talking about dance. And UITM, do your technology. Uh, USM, maybe research with the sciences. And then in Sabah and Sarawak, focus on developing research material on indigenous art. So every university has a, has a role to play. And as a young 17-year-old. Now the other thing is, for example, when uh, you know, we have lawyers here, we have people who became, who let's say they want to become a doctor. But you do study science from the time you are 10 years old. You study maths from the time you're 10 years old. So that by the time you're 17 years old, you, you're quite aware, yeah, I'm really good at biology and chemistry and I want to be a doctor or a scientist, right? But here we don't have any arts programs in the schools until they're 17 and 18, and then they push them to Aswara and wherever, and you say, oh, now you have to become a great artist. 
How is that even possible? It's ridiculous to talk about it. So we now we have Scholar Sunni, and then everybody talks to me, but oh, they don't know we had a Scholar Sunni. Oh, Malaysia has a school of performing arts. Yes, we do have many schools of performing arts, and most of them have no facilities. So this is my problem, you know, we create it and then they have no building. You just go down the road, go to Singapore, and look at Singapore School of the Arts, you will cry. You know, because their day one is better than uh, Phil Day One Philharmonic. That everything is built so purpose purpose built for this for the arts. So we have in Kuchi, in Johor, in yes, where else? You just I can't remember where else we have scholars in. But from 2005, we have been building scholars in 2007. Nobody knows, right? Yes, but then the other issue is, who are the people teaching in the scholar studies? Bless them, lovely people, blah, 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 blah. But they are not well trained to teach dance. They don't know about dance injuries. They don't know about injury prevention. They don't know about rehabilitation. They know very little about history, etc., etc., etc. Because they're generally school teachers, you know? So this is another issue. So we build, Malaysia, this stuff, we are so good at this, right? And we don't figure out how we're going to maintain it, how we're going to upgrade it, and so on. So I think this, this is a... Uh, this is a problem that we face. And then we have Pamata. So we have the new program that's created by, now it's called Genius. Uh, this is Genius. So they're very genius. So nobody else is genius. So Pamata is a really lovely name. But then, how do you then justify money that goes here and not here? You know, these are issues that we must talk about. Come together and discuss it so that we know. And we don't do enough of that in this country, you know. So every new leader wants his own brand stamped on it. So higher. Yeah, so a, Aswara was ASK, Academy Sadiq Bangsa. Beautiful name, lovely logo, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we became Aswara. Then comes a, a, a director who says, no, we must, I love P. Ramli, and this must be called University P. Ramli. So they spent millions of dollars trying to brand it as University P. Ramli. And then before he got to do it, they lost the election, and then bye-bye. And then somebody else comes and, oh, we got to go to Trinidad, we got to go here, we got to go there. Yeah, Sabah, wherever, whoever is the Mantri. The Mantri comes, oh, now everybody does Igariga because the Mantri is from Sabah. <laughs> oh, tomorrow the Mantri is from Johor, everybody <laughs> must do Zappi. So that's the mindset. We're so effing screwed up, you know? That's what we are. You know, we just really need to get like in conclusion. <laughs> yes. But you know, you gotta love the arts and you gotta do what you gotta do, so stop being so sad. You can be angry, I think angry is not useful, you know? So angry young men are always find rich friends, I always tell best advice. <laughs> no use la, yeah. <laughs> My advice to all boys and girls I teach, find a rich man or woman to get married to, and you build a theater and so on for you. So <laughs> Um, for the music aspect, um, I think I think it's up to you know just talking about opportunities in education and things like that. A lot of people, a lot of the younger generation or the young generation or whatever, like, they think that there's only one outlet in music. You know, they think that okay, if you love music, you gotta be a performer. You love music, that's what you gotta do. You gotta learn how to sing, you gotta learn how to play an instrument, and you have to be on stage, you gotta be front, out, there, and then. But then we don't know here, because we're not educated, that okay, there's also music management, there's music talent management, there's music business management, there's being a talent agent. Like all these things, all these different outlets that you can do if you love music. And you know what? Some of us we love music, but some of us are just not cut out to be performers. And that's okay because we create for appreciators. We create for people who are going to be able to help us get to believe in our art, who are going to help us manage, who are going to help get us gigs, who are going to help book us the best venues they think which suit us. Stage design you know, art design. But I think right now what's happening in Malaysia is that we don't know. Like there's no there's no other, you know, outlets we can do. Much of accounting, right? Like, oh my god. Yeah. The last thing I want to think about as a musician is picking tax, okay? Alright? And I don't I want to read that contract that's like this thing, you know? 
So a lot of youngsters say like, hey, I can't have to be a doctor in my life. You gotta stay in school because we need you. <laughs> okay? I'm like, but, oh, what do you want to do? I, I wanna, I wanna manage my friend. I, my friend's very talented, but you know, he's gonna need you to do his books. Okay? <laughs> We're gonna need you to sort out the taxes. And I'm like, you know what? There is, I literally cannot think of two or three like accounting firms that just cater to the entertainment industry. Because that requires a whole different, you know, like a set of laws, set of rules, because there's a lot of things that's waived for us, there's a lot of charges that's for us only, you know, or even law, for example, entertainment law. Like, I find it's quite limited here because for me, I have to like the people that I'm working with. You know, it's not just, I, I, I want to be able to have options of personalities that click with me. You know, and not just like, okay, this is this person, this is going to be your person now. No, because for me, like, the people who are in my team have to be extensions of my beliefs, have to be extensions of my vision and mission, and our philosophy always has to be the same, but it's just like, we have to know our place and we have to be okay with that. Don't do too much of what you're supposed to do and don't do too less. You have to know where your place is and do that with passion. Even though if you do light ska, if you do sound ska on the side stage, backstage, but you have to do it with passion and so much consciousness and awareness. And I think coming back to what we're actually supposed to be here talking about, I think like digitally, because right now I had to unfollow almost everybody on my Instagram because I want it so much, I unfollow it. Because that was my form of detox, because I found that like, okay, I want it too much. But I'm always there on the explore page, you know. But the thing is, it's very, very important that we use something because we live in a very visual world right now. And the only way is like, I know a lot of my peers, the only, they don't even read the newspaper anymore because they use Facebook. That's how we read about news right now, is Facebook. And retweets and reposts and stories. And I think if we want to really engage with the people who are going to make the next steps of decisions, very, very big decisions. We need people who are not afraid to say like, look, I have passion for what I do and I'm frustrated because who do I talk to if I want to make things happen? You know, who do, who do we talk to about that? We've tried everything. We've tried proposing here, proposing there, nothing. The money's not coming. And it's very clicky here, you know? And they really kind of like, we can choose. You connect in a suburb. Who's your connection? Who do you know? And we have to change that mindset. Sorry, I'm getting sad now. <laughs> <laughs> but really, we have to change that mindset. And the thing is, it's like, yeah, in some ways, a lot of, there's a big group of people in Malaysia that's not ready for social media. Look at what people are saying online. Look at what people are sharing online. I don't want to see what happened in the accident, no. But we're just, we just haven't changed our mindset yet. Okay? Talking about Kedekian, my God, what an ugly emotion to have. Right? And it's very race specific to her. Huh? Why? To me, when I come back, sorry, but I have to talk about it. Now I'm sad too. <laughs> it's because it's the truth. As you said, we have, for me, I advocate the truth. To me, if we're not honest, if we just keep on like putting sugar on it, we're not going to get anything done. Every time we go to one of these talks, it's always about can I put funding? funding, not enough support. Okay, we know what the problem is now. Let's have more of these talks so we can talk about the solution. Yeah, like I've been away for the past twelve years. Okay, from my my whole twenties, I've been away. Professor. You've been an educator for more than three decades. You know, you've gone around the world and you're the best at what you do.
So <laughs> I just think we really should really bring like the experiences, you know, for me, I'm still a student among students in this life, and I feel like, you know, young people get so much bad rep for just ranting. But I think support for each other is really important, guys. discussed quite a lot of things. I think the issues are very interesting and pertinent. Uh, the value of digital, what are we using with digital media and uh, intelligence? Uh, how do we think beyond it? Uh, is there a necessity for us to prepare ourselves for the world of artificial intelligence and how it will impact our lives? Uh, so I think these are very useful. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, all my life has been about addressing issues and problems that I deal with on a constant basis. Yeah. Um, and I've cried many tears too, but maybe I'm old and hardened and I just don't cry very much anymore, except in town movies. But, um, <laughs> you know, but I think that I will go back to people being passionate about what they want to do. And you know, I want to just end by sharing a story about, I just came back from Cambodia. And if you will know that between 1975 and 1979, Cambodia was taken over by the Khmer Rouge. Uh, and the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot destroyed and chased away almost all the artists' co communities. Uh, and why? Because artists are dangerous. Because yeah. artists yeah, yeah. speak yeah. their minds. Propaganda. Yes, and artists talk to everybody. So your best friend can be the Prime Minister, but your best friend can also be the the person who cleans the toilet. So artists are very powerful in that way. So I came to uh, because a very good friend of mine works in what he calls Cambodia Living Art, and he founded this organization. And he came back from America, and he told you know he talks about his four years in the jungle, about torture, about murder, about rape and abuse, and so on. But he survived it. Went to America. He was um, adopted by an American family, and after ten years. He said, I need to go back to Cambodia to build my country. So he and many other like-minded people went, one person at a time, locating artists who were the, the masters of music and dance and, and singing. Yes. yes, and they were and they were on the street, some of them drunk, some of them uh, abused, and their lives totally broken and shattered. And he pulled them together, one person at a time, and started recording their music and singing the old songs that they don't sing anymore. And when a person has been faced with that kind of life-death situation, and I'm thinking, what am I complaining about? Why? Because Nayan did give me 20,000 for me to do my show. <laughs> no, I'm going to ask myself what I'm going to do. And so that man and that organization, I, I, I think about them all the time. It is about having so much love for what you do and for the arts. Uh, whatever it is you do, music or dance or whatever, and feeling that it's okay, you know, I'm not the greatest recipient of JKKN's funding money uh, or Chandana or whoever, few people that we have that give money sometimes, you know, but it's okay, you know, uh, I'm still going to do it. I'm not going to let them stop me from doing it because this is what I want and this is what's going to make me happy and this is what I think is important uh, and I believe that this is what you have to discover, whether you're sad, happy, angry, you know. But many years ago, I'll finish with one more story. I didn't mention Yunus, who, uh, under my guidance or my advice or against a lot of fighting with me, maybe, inside, he decided to do his Arangetram in uh, Bharatanatyam. So he was the first uh, Aswara Malay boy who took up in 2011. So we have. So I have like maybe three, four students that's coming around there too, who are also different. And I think this is also very beautiful about finding what their strengths are. So he isn't afraid to dance Bharatanatyam. He isn't worshipping some gods that he doesn't understand, you know. Of course, Ramli has paved the way. But this is, I think, a Malaysia that can be so beautiful. But if not everybody wants to share our dream, it's okay. I think it's fine. We'll just find a community that does. 
right? Thank you so much, everyone. I hope the conversation continues. We all want this. We all want to be in front. So please take it in mind. So thank you very much. And I'd like to call on all the artists to really consider their creation beyond digital. Thank you. See you tomorrow night. See you tomorrow night.